Hello, hello. Want to do a little bit of Shakespeare today? I do. Uh, so this time we're looking at Romeo and Juliet, the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Um, and as I discussed before, this is really a play about civil unrest uh, crushing young love. Uh, in Shakespeare's time, it was the rapier that was flooding the streets. That was the weapon of the day. People were using it, uh, and there was blood in the streets every day. Um, if Shakespeare were writing the play today, I think it would be gun violence. It would probably be uh, gun violence in schools and how, uh, how that destroys young love. Um, but in Shakespeare's day, it was the sword called the rapier. Uh, and so this really is, um, this is a, a story ripped from the headlines when Shakespeare wrote it. This, there's not one person in the audience on opening night for the first opening night that didn't either lose someone close to them or know someone who lost someone close to them stabbed by a rapier. Uh, so everyone's thinking about it. Uh, no one knows what to do about it. Everyone's uh, afraid to walk the streets. Everyone's nervous and looking over their shoulders. And they come to the theater and they find they, they can't get away from it tonight. We're going to talk about this tonight. Uh, and it begins uh, with the chorus, uh, which is, you know, it's a dramatic device that started in uh, Greece, you know, way back when they invented drama. And it's basically uh, here... Uh, just an actor, one of the company, coming to talk to the audience about what they might expect tonight. Um, I remember, uh, you know, the, the tradition is alive. Even in, like, if you watch uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, there's a snowman who functions as a, as a chorus. Uh, so it's a well-trodden device. But uh, this chorus comes before the audience, and he says, Two households both alike in dignity. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which to their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. And off we go. Uh, it's it's nice to, uh, to right here Shakespeare's saying this play should take two hours so if anyone's producing Romeo and Juliet and is taking longer than two hours you're probably talking too slowly um, we start uh, with a brawl you know we're get, we get right to it and we're going to watch a street fight happen uh, and we start with uh, what is it Samson and Gregory uh, and they are uh, talking about they are two Capulets and they're talking about how much they hate the Montagues. They're going back and forth. Um, they're joking with each other. Um, and this brings up something. Um, comedy is actually harder than tragedy in Shakespeare because comedy is, is a lot of um, turning of phrases and um, allusions to things that we don't talk about anymore. Or, or <laughs> like... like you, I find that when I'm when I'm doing comedy or I'm telling a joke in Shakespeare, I've got to be checking a lot of footnotes to find out what are they even saying. Uh, it gets very confusing. Whereas tragedy is much more straightforward. Uh, um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna belabor all the jokes that are throwing around. Uh, but you know how you know, like a joke. If you if you watched a comedian back in the fifties. You wouldn't know about all the people that the guy's referencing that he's joking about. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know some of the lingo of the time, and so you might not get the jokes. Well, it's even worse. 
<laughs> when you're talking about Shakespeare. Uh, so it, it takes it takes a lot of work to understand a Shakespearean joke most of the time. Um, and that's why in, in dramas, they often cut some of the comedy just because they don't want to deal with it. Um, but basically, they're joking around and setting up the fact that they're basically hunting for Montagues. They're pissed off for some reason, and they want to find one to beat up or basically to murder in the streets with their rapiers that they have at their sides. Um, and they find one. They find two. They find Abraham and Balthazar. And Gregory says, I will frown as they pass by. Let them take it as they list. Samson says, nay, as they dare. I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. Now, biting with your thumb is that, which is Italian for... So, so they do that. And Abraham says, do you bite your th thumb at us, sir? Which is, did you just flip us off? Now, when they, when that happened at the theater, I'm, I'm sure the, the whole audience went, uh, like, here we go. I've seen this one happen on the streets. Did you just flip me off, man? Um, there's a silence that happens after that. There's like, everyone's like, whoa. Um, and uh, Biting your thumb. I've seen Romeo and Juliet plays where that gets a laugh just because we're not used to that phrase, but it's a very serious thing. And it has to be played that way. There has to be an inherent, immediate violence that's about to happen between these between the actors. Um, so Abraham says, did you just flip us off, man? Samson says, I did, I did flip the bird. I'm paraphrasing. And then Abraham says, did you, flip, did you flip us off? And then Samson turns to Gregory and says, is the law on our side if I say yes? Gregory says, no, it's not. Samson says, no, sir, I do not flip you off, but I, do, I did flip the bird, sir. And then Gregory, Samson's friend, says, well, are you quarreling, sir? They're, they're trying to pick a fight. Abraham says, quarrel, sir? No, sir. Samson says, if you do, sir, I'm for you. I serve as good a man as you are. Abraham, Abraham says, no better. Well, you're, you're, you're as good as I am, but you're not even better. Samson says, well, sir. Gregory says, say better. Here comes one of our master's kinsmen. Samson says, yes, better, sir. Abraham says, you lie. And the fight starts. So basically... He says, say you're better than he is, because here's a third one, a third Capulet walking down the street. So now it's going to be three on two. So let's start the fight. Uh, the law's not on our side, but we're going to win the fight anyway. And the fight happens. Now, the, the third Capulet walking toward them is Benvolio. And he immediately tries to break up the fight. Now, Benvolio is often cast as this, like, super nice guy, super Mr. Trustable guy. I argue that he's one of the bravest people in the play. I don't know if anybody out there has tried to break up a fight before, but a lot of people choose not to even try because you can really get a fist in the face if you try to break up a fight. So Benvolio decides he alone is going to break up of he's going to break up four guys who are fighting with rapiers. So Benvolio, I think how everyone casts Benvolio, that dude's got balls. He's not just a nice guy. He's a guy, he's a nice guy with real courage. And uh, in the middle of, of him trying to break up the fight, um, Tybalt comes in. Now, Tybalt is a badass. Montague. Capulet is Romeo's side. So it's Romeo Capulet and then and then uh, Juliet Montague. So Tybalt is on is on uh, Juliet's side of this. Um, Romeo is the son of the head of the Capulets and and Juliet is the daughter of the head of the Montagues. Uh, they couldn't be more star-crossed. So anyway, Tybalt comes in, cousin of Juliet, who we haven't met yet, and he's like, what's going on? Benvolio's like, I'm trying to break up a fight. Would you help me? And he's like, and Tybalt's basically like, F that, man. 
I'm in. And he draws on Benvolio and it's just like a, in this pandemonium. And they start fighting. And then suddenly the whole street erupts and everybody's fighting each other. Not all just with, with rapiers. Not everyone has one, but everyone's grabbing what they can. And they're trying to kill each other en masse. Again, this has to be staged in a way where it's freaking scary. It's serious. Uh, it's not comedic. Uh, it's not light. It is horrific. It has to be horrific. Uh, because, again, we have to imagine if this was a, if Shakespeare was writing a modern play, uh, this would be the equivalent of someone pulling out a gun in a high school. And that's just not going to be played any other way than horrific. So we have to, we have, I think one has to give respect to the play and to the time that it was written in and what was going on for the people who were watching it originally. Um, and it's pandemonium. It's not Muppets pandemonium. Uh, and then comes in the prince, uh, who is, you know, the, the king. He's the, the royalty in town. He controls everything. And he comes in with his soldiers. And he says, cut it out. Enough. He says, rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighborhood stained steel. Will it not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts, that quench the fire of your pernicious, pernicious rage with purple fountains issuing from your veins on pain of torture from these, those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground. And hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil brawls, bred of an airy word by thee, old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets. So by this time, the heads of the households have joined the fight. I didn't mention that. So old Capulet and old Montague have come. They are trying to join the fight. Their wives are trying to pull them back. The prince comes in and just says, everyone is, stop it, throw your weapons down. Now, what law there is in Verona is this one guy and whatever guards he might have. He doesn't have a police force. He doesn't have a court system. The law is just him. And he's doing his best. He's walking around the streets. He's trying to enforce peace and calm. But, I mean, we have police now. And I don't know if anyone's been mugged, but I have. Every time I've been mugged, there were no police around. The police were just basically there to clean up the mess. And that's with a whole police department. This poor guy has just got himself and a whole city to try to keep from killing each other. So uh, again, this play is about a new, very efficient weapon called the rapier being introduced into a society without a police force, without a court system, where you have to protect your honor. Uh, and this guy, this poor prince, is doing the best he can, but um, one man can only do so much. And he breaks up the fight, and he tells, tells that he wants to talk with both the heads of the households, one now and one later. Um, and uh, everyone goes... Uh, and Benvolio explains to uh, Montague. Okay, I was wrong. It's Romeo Montague and Juliet Capulet. Oh, I always get that wrong. Sorry to confuse you. Um, and where, let's see. Uh, the Lord Montague asks Benvolio how did the fight start. Benvolio explains. Uh, Lady Montague says, "Where's Romeo? Saw you, saw him today. Right glad I am that he was not at this at this fray." And Benvolio says, "Well, I saw him earlier in the morning, but uh, he he didn't want to talk to me, so he left." And then and then Montague, Romeo's father, says this: "Many a morning hath he there been seen with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs." But all too soon as the all-cheering sun should in the furthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from light he steals home, my heavy son, and private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, 
and makes himself an artificial knight. Black and portentous must this humor prove, unless good counsel made the cause remove. And they ask him, they ask Benvolio, who's Romeo's friend, to go talk to him and find out what's going on. And they leave. And uh, then Romeo comes in and we meet him. And he is sad. He is in love. Uh, but he's in the suffering part of love. Because he's fallen in love, not with not with Juliet, not yet. He's in love with a woman who has uh, who wants to be a nun. So she has made a vow to remain chaste all her life, and she's been rebuffing Romeo. And Romeo can't fall out of love with her. She's amazing, apparently, but but uh, but she's not available, and he's really suffering. And they talk about that for a while. Uh, it's basically just exposition, but we meet Romeo fully in love. He's obviously at a point in his life where love is going to be happening now. You know, he's a teenager. And uh, and he knows he's screwed. He knows that she can't be talked out of it, and he doesn't know what to do about it. He doesn't know, how do I fall out of love with her? She's I can't stop her from being amazing. Benvolio's like, well, why don't you talk to other girls? And he's like, well, I tried that, but every time I talk to another girl she, who's just like passing fair, it just reminds me, this, she's not as amazing as the woman that I'm in love with. So it doesn't work. And they walk off together. Uh, and that's the first two scenes of Romeo and Juliet. And we will continue next week. Uh, and I hope that this has been a good beginning. This is a long video. <laughs> I love to talk. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening.